Well, we're at the top of the hour, so uh, I'd say let's let's kick off the 2021 virtual conference for the Air Cool Condensers Users Group. Uh, my name is Scott Schwieger. I am an editor with Combined Cycle Journal, uh, and in, back in 2009, uh, we worked together with Barry Dooley and Andy Howell to uh, to start the ACC Users Group, and have been covering it and following it closely uh, ever since. Uh, so today's focus in day one is going to be chemistry and corrosion. And the session moderator is Barry Dooley of Structural Integrity Associates out of the UK. Uh, while we look at the agenda here for a second, um, I'd just like to let everyone know we want to make this uh, session as interactive as possible. Um, that means you can use the chat. Uh, we, you'll see a chat icon and a participants icon down at the bottom right of your screen. If you have those open, you can chat in your questions and comments during the presentation. Uh, you could also alternatively raise your hand uh, in your participants tab right next to your name. You'll see a little hand um, and then we'll call on you during the <clears throat> dedicated uh, Q&A and discussion session after each presentation. And as you can see, we've got two half hour slots uh, at the end of the uh, first half of the day and at the end of the day for open discussion and to follow up on anything that we missed uh, during the presentations. So I'd like to introduce the steering committee of the ACC users group first. Uh, we've got Andy Howell of EPRI, Barry Dooley of Structural Integrity, Riyadh Dandan of Dominion Energy and Rishi Velkar of Envy Energy. Uh, they'll all be serving as your moderators and session chairs throughout the conference. And, uh, you know, you'll hear a lot from them. And we would also like to thank the sponsors who made this uh, conference possible. Uh, we've got Gail Breaker, Suez, CC Jensen, Conco, Rikon, SPG Dry Cooling, MVM EGI, IPC Leiden, and EVAPCO. Um, if you go to the ACC Users Group website, you will see uh, the conference webpage uh, and you can interact with the, uh, with the teams from each of these companies and find out more about what they do. They offer a wide range of services uh, from engineering, uh, <clears throat> construction, and uh, water treatment uh, for ACCs. So it's a good to, this would be a great way for you to connect and familiarize yourself with these companies. And without further ado, I would like to introduce Barry Dooley, who will be presenting first today. Uh, Barry, take it away. Thank you. Um, and, uh, oh, you can just share this and um, I'll just put this on. This is good. And it should, it should be okay, Scott, right? All good. Thank you. So, um, uh, good afternoon to um, to everybody uh, joining this um, ACC users group, and uh, welcome to everybody around the world. So, good morning in some places, um, good afternoon here, good evening, and good night in some in in some places. So, this is um, a, a pleasure uh, for us to um, to have this uh, meeting, and we have very good. A turnout uh, for this in terms of presentations this time, and uh, so we're very pleased with the virtual format, and in some ways even a little bit, bit better than the live meetings that we've had. So for you, for um, for many of you that have not joined an ACC UG before, uh, we uh, Andy and I started these meetings informally in uh, 2007, I, I think. Uh, we've done a little bit of work before then to understand the corrosion that takes place. That was the first one. So uh, we've had uh, pretty much an annual meeting ever, uh, ever, ever since. So the introduction here to this uh, corrosion and psychochemistry section is going to, um, is, is, is basically going to take uh, three parts. First of all, it's going to int introduce you uh, two ACCs in fossil combined cycle and HRSG plants, which is normal. And uh, we're trying very hard to uh, to add industrial plants because from all the assessments that I make around the world, 
and particularly in industrial plants, it seems that a lot of the information that's uh, that's known is not being uh, transitioned into the industrial plants. So we usually like to um, to have a review uh, for the new participants because we usually have uh, at least 50% new new participants that haven't joined ACCUG before. And so what I'm going to do here is um, is is basically uh, two things. I'm going to provide a little bit of review of some of the key aspects from uh, all the way back from 2007. And uh, some of these, of course, um, will be familiar to those who have attended before. And as you'll see um, later on in this session, uh, there's quite a, a number of plants that are using film forming substances. And uh, so we thought that we would provide an update an international on the international understanding of uh, film forming substances. So, so let me get, uh, let, let me get started here. Um, and uh, so I think everybody knows that ACC come in many sizes. Um, they, they usually have the same uh, configurations. But what, what, whatever and wherever they are, uh, we find that the FAC and the corrosion damage that takes place is basically the same worldwide with all the different chemistries. And this is based on, on assessments and inspection work that, that I've conducted in all these uh, countries, uh, plus presentations at uh, ACC UG and, and, and uh, plus the uh, presentations that we have within the IAPS uh, FFS uh, organization. And, uh, so this is the typical, uh, so this is the typical damage that, uh, that, that we're going to be talking about. Basically um, at the tube entries, as you can see here in the upper ducts um, and here, and uh, on, the cross, on the cross support members uh, here and, and here, and then in the transport ducting from, this, from the steam turbine. And uh, basically, uh, the more white areas there are, and the worse the white areas are, the worse is the damage, and the, and the greater is the corrosion. And of course, that means the higher is the transport of iron into the main part of the plant. And uh, what we found over the years is that um, it is that this uh, corrosion, uh, FAC, as we call it. Um, has a number of consequences. Uh, the main one, of course, are the high concentrations of iron around the cycle, which uh, leads to boiler and HRSG uh, deposits, perhaps having expensive chemical cleaning. It leads to uh, tube failures in, in these systems, boiler tube failures. Under deposit corrosion is probably the main one. Uh, some overheating due to heavy deposits and thermal fatigue. And there are also over the years we've seen steam turbine deposits, and particularly uh, with regards to the aluminium from the ACC. Uh, we need to have uh, iron removal processes, condensate polishing or filters. Uh, there could be limitations then when we have to control the FAC. We might have to change the, the mode of operation of polishers. And overall, what we find is that uh, if if there's an ACC in in a particular plant, then it basically controls the unit cycle chemistry. There are, of course, international guidelines that are available for ACC and for two phase flow. So, about uh, 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 more than ten years ago now, uh, we developed a um, a corrosion index called the DACI index. And, uh, and this is used all over the world to compare and to categorize corrosion and organizations uh, can use this to track improvements. And um, there's just a, a very brief summary of this. Uh, this DACI index is now, of course, the, uh, is, is, the, is the basis for the ACC uh, UG uh, guideline for internal inspection. Uh, there's two parts to it. The part for the tube entries in the in the upper duct has basically five categories, with the first category number one being with the tube entries in relatively good shape, with basically no damage, all the way to number five, which is the most serious holes in the tubing or welding, obvious corrosion, etc. And I'm going to show you some examples um, of this uh, as we go through. This is for the upper ducts. 
Um, Why isn't it going forward? Oh, the, for the, 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 lower, for the lower ducts and the, ah, and the, and the transport. Okay, thank you. Uh, for the transport ducts, the, there are three. There are three levels: A, B, and C. Again, with the first one being no sign of damage, and the second one being serious damage. And so, when you combine these two, you might have a, an overall index for a particular plant as 3B or 4A, or something like that. And uh, and so then you would you would be able to compare that with others around the world. But we we know what the corrosion looks like. I already showed you some, but now now this has the uh, the index the index on it, the DC index, uh, as as an example. And we know what the holes. Uh, what holes look like at the, at the at the worst level for corrosion. Uh, we also find that inspections around the world show basically the same uh, features. Um, combined cycle here. In, this is for a combined cycle, basically the same as in a as in a fossil a conventional fossil plant. So this is after some period of time operating at a pretty low pH here. And you can see this, these extensive white areas, which are the FAC at the tube entries and on the cross members uh, as well. And there's usually a concentration of this corrosion underneath the cross members, as you can see, as you can see here. Similar sort of thing for a, for a fossil plant. This is a supercritical unit, but again, after some period of time operating at a, a relatively low pH, you can see the white uh, FAC uh, damage here. Uh, concentrated over over on the right hand side, underneath the support structures, and then uh, quite uh, uh, quite a lot of damage on the actual support structures themselves. And uh, so this is basically what uh, what is seen uh, everywhere, pretty much the same. And uh, we learned uh, quite a long ago, time, uh, a time ago. But to understand the uh, the corrosion that took place in these upper in these upper ducts or upper streets at the tube entries, we need to apply the understanding that had been developed uh, previously for the environment in the steam turbine at, at the phase transition zone. And uh, some years ago, I developed this little um, uh, this little schematic to illustrate uh, just very simply what's happening. So. As the superheated steam flows through the uh, the low pressure steam turbine, as it crosses the saturation line and enters the phase transition zone, it nucleates heterogeneously these uh, droplets. Uh, we call these the first condensate droplets. Uh, uh, these these are are quite uh, highly concentrated in in anions, and uh, the droplet size is something like uh, less than 0 0.1 microns. So these uh, gradually flow through the uh, through the steam turbine, and becoming diluter and diluter until they exit and they go to the uh, to to the ACC. There's also the formation of liquid films on the blade surface. You can you can see this schematically here, and these are uh, uh, about 120 microns as the liquid as the liquid film flows off the blade. The the, the liquid it breaks up into smaller smaller but large droplets. So exiting to the air cool condenser here, we have a large a large amount of small droplets and uh, a smaller amount of uh, large droplets, which will which we'll come back to in a few um, in a few minutes. So we under we understand uh, the environment, but uh, can we prevent the corrosion mechanism from taking place? We find uh, uh, from these ACC meetings and uh, from, ins from inspections and assessments that solutions are being applied. And probably the most important one at the moment is increasing the bulk condensate pH, can be up to 9.8. I'll show you the curve in a minute. Uh, we know that this works and is validated. We can change to an amine, uh, including using, uh, uh, including uh, film forming substances. And both of these appear to work, but the science is not fully understood or explained as I'll, as I'll indicate a little later. 
we generally need filters, um, average size and absolute size and condensate polishers. And we know that we can lower the total iron going into the plant, but it doesn't stop the FAC and the damage of the tube in. And then there are various other things that have been tried, coatings, sleeves, inserts, alternate materials, but generally uh, not very extensive and not and very successful. And uh, so, so this is the curve. Uh, this is uh, uh, tech one. Tech. This is iron. You can see to get to the low levels that you would want. Know that this uh, we know that this works. Uh, there's a couple of takes a little bit of time to arrest. Well, actually, we don't know what time it takes because. We only intermittently uh, do this for this particular the, uh, the, the white areas of of, um, of FAC with a day CO4 and uh, and then uh, after increasing the pH the, the the FAC improves we get magnetite formed on these surfaces a little bit of magnetite on the cross members. And the uh, and the DC of course uh, 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 decreases as as indicated, um, and um, so this is one example. Here's another. Here's another example. Pretty much the same thing. Is uh, after, after inspection after 15 months, um, uh, after operating with a higher pH, you can see the white areas originally, and uh, and what they look like. Um, after increasing the pH and the, and the DC index decreases as expected. And uh, you can see that the white areas have disappeared. In fact, they formed the magnetite. And then during the shutdown process, they, they get this red coloration. On the cross members, you can see that magnetite has, has, has formed here in agreement with in agreement with what we would uh, expect. And uh, there are there are um, that there are achievable limits that uh, that are reasonably recognized ar around the world for achievable levels of iron uh, for air cooled condensers at the ACC outlet. Um, if if um, if the if the corrosion is under control and the DC index is low, uh, a one or a two, then we would expect that the total iron levels uh, would would be in this range. Um, and uh, if there's a polisher, if, the, if, there's a, if there's a filter, then we would expect that the iron levels could, easy, could, could easily meet uh, 5 ppb. And, uh, and, and this is basically what we, we see. Agreement between the DC index and the, and the total iron and the total iron levels. The, um, the, we now learned uh, from, uh, from uh, a number of sources. Uh, uh, this ACC users group, uh, the, the IAPS international conferences on FFS, and uh, various assessments that uh, that the uh, that the two phase FAC can also be arrested uh, with uh, with a film forming substance, and this shows a significant reduction in the DC index, as you can see here, and you can also see that uh, the tube entries have lost their whiteness. And the tube supports have also lost their whiteness, and they first of all have to form the magnetite um, on the surface, and then they and then they will gradually become the same color as the as the rest of the ducts. So, so that so that's the end of the um, of the first part that I wanted to present. The second part here is um, on um, uh, film forming substances because. Uh, we are seeing more and more use of this uh, for air cool condensers, but there's some things that need to be dealt with pretty carefully. You'll see that there are three um, uh, presentations uh, in in today's uh, session, and I'm going to provide you a little summary of the international experience and some of the information and some of the uh, factors which are are missing and not and not not understood. We are quite lucky in that um, we had an IAP symposium a couple of weeks ago in, in September, 
uh, where David Addison from the uh, IAPS organization in New Zealand and myself uh, presented uh, some of this uh, so some of this information. And I'm just going to give you a very brief summary uh, now. Uh, it can be followed up if anybody else is interested. Uh, in terms of the nomenclature that we use, um, there are there are basically uh, two types uh, of film forming substance. Uh, one that's amine based, and we call these FFA or FFAP. And uh, the FFP is the um, are the non amine based ones. So these over here in this yellow box show you the active ingredient of the amine based ones, ODA, OLA, and older here. And of course, these film forming products here are proprietary, and generally the uh, composition of them is not is is not known. And this is um, uh, one of uh, one of the unfortunate uh, things, of course, is that there aren't just single um, editions of these. There are many varieties, and uh, David and I tried to summarize this on the next two slides. Uh, you can see you can see right here. So there's a wide range of uh, FFS uh, products and mixtures. Um, you can see across the top here gen some general categories. Uh, film forming products, non amine, uh, film forming amines with uh, which are pH stabilized, uh, film forming amines which are hom hom homogenization stabilized, and uh, uh, the final one, pH stabilized and blended with some with some other compounds such as dispersants. Uh, applications are all across the fossil and the uh, the industrial regime, and there's some description. There's some description here. Very loose descriptions where these are all a combination of these three different active ingredients, and then the proprietary ones are not uh, essentially not known. Concentration here is um, is generally in this in this range as shown, and the unfortunate thing is that the chemical and thermophysical properties are generally not understood. There is some limited understanding of for for. For some of these, uh, the amine based ones, particularly for ODA, as I'll mention, and very limited understanding for the non amine based ones. And uh, so there's also a wide range of suppliers uh, globally. And, uh, uh, and uh, you can see here uh, for the same, uh, for the same uh, range of compounds here, there's probably 10. In different suppliers around 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 the world, which makes it very difficult for us. Who produce uh, guidance uh, for plants to 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 derive that because of the because of the differences in each one of these uh, in in each one of these compounds, and uh, so the next few slides, what I want to do is just give you an, an indication of uh, some of the key uh, uh, some of the key features, a summary of um, uh, a summary of the research um, that's being done. And a summary, uh, if possible, of the plant applications. And uh, FFS have been applied to basically all the different types of plants that are available fossil, combined cycle, HRSGs, and industrial plants, uh, and all of, the, all of these with and without air cool condensers. Um, and these are some of the new, uh, some of the industrial plants here. And, and then there's some effort now to produce uh, guidance for nuclear plant. Uh, IAPS expects to have uh, the first uh, draft of uh, FFS guideline for nuclear plant by the end of the year. There's lots of examples that uh, that we've seen on operation, what happens during operation when we have these compounds, and shutdown and preservation. Um, some of the science uh, has been addressed. Uh, thermal decomposition is the main one, um, and uh, and this has been done essentially for ODA. But also uh, for uh, a little bit for older uh, film formation has been looked at um, detection visually. You can do that in the laboratory by by looking for the hydrophobicity, and in laboratory with um, XPS and and, and e EIS. There's work on absorption of surfaces, and there's also work on understanding the actual film formation itself. Some very nice work that was just that was just. Uh, done in the last year to look at the uh, to how how thick these films are typically 10 nanometers uh, and the work has essentially been done with odor 
uh, and we find that there is good performance up to these temperatures and, uh, and porosity is one of the things that we have to uh, that we have to avoid. There's some work done on FAC um, in the uh, laboratory, but uh, unfortunately, uh, as the um, air cool condenser environment is two phase, the results of those laboratory experiments are not as good for um, for the two phase for the two phase situation. Probably of uh, probably of more interest for this group um, are the um, are the um, applications in plants. And uh, what we usually find uh, are when when presentations are made, and I'm sure we'll we'll see those today in the in the three presentations. Uh, universal reductions in feed water iron and copper if there's copper in the system, but no basic understanding of the mechanisms of the oxide growth or formation or reduction. But in an ACC, of course, you have to form the magnetite first before before it can be sl slowed down. So there's very little understanding of exactly how that takes place and, and how the FFS interfaces in the condensate for a cool condenser, in the feed water, boiler water, and steam. There's general observations, of course, that nearly everybody shows uh, hydrophobic films on water touch surfaces, but it's, it's, it is underlined particularly that hydrophobicity does not prove the presence of the film or, or, or protection. And there's very little uh, film formation remains very questionable on steam touch surfaces. And there's bit really no understanding how, how uh, anything can happen to steam grown oxides. So what we would say is that the basic understanding has improved since uh, about 2014, but there are still problems occurring. And this is what people have to be very concerned about when they're applying these for ACC applications. These, uh, these uh, situations are not openly published uh, and uh, they involve internal deposits, uh, tube failures, especially under deposit corrosion, formation of gunk uh, deposits in drums and on heat transfer surfaces, on steam turbines and strainers and filters. And I've got a couple of examples just to show you uh, uh, what they look like. And uh, so this is an example from combined cycle plant uh, HP evaporator using an, an FFAP. This is a film forming amine product with something else added to the active ingredient. And uh, you can see the heavy internal deposits here on the inside surfaces of the tubes. And when we cut those open, you see these very heavy deposits uh, here. And when we look at these in detail, we find that these are, are multi laminated, which is the typical structure that we see for under deposit corrosion. So this is a good example of under deposit under deposit corrosion. Second, second example is an example of a gunk formation in LP drum. That's these darker areas here uh, that you can see below the red here, um, and you can see uh, some of this product here in in a hand, and uh, you can also at the same time see some hydrophobicity of these little droplets on this on the surfaces. Trying to identify this is very difficult. We've tried for many, many, many years. It was first recognized probably 30 years ago that, that this could happen. And uh, so we generally find that there's a presence of hydrocarbon or functional groups, and it could be carbonyl or, or carboxylic acid, but it, it's not really clearly understood exactly what happens. So uh, we know that all of these instances, all of these uh, damage mechanisms and the problems all relate to this lack of understanding of what happens when we add a film forming substance to uh, these plants and, and what is the film forming substance likely to do to that oxide that's on those, on those surfaces. So we've taken a, a, quite a look at, um, at, at, at these looking at the influence of film forming substances on oxide growth around, around the generating cycle, not only in the uh, condensate and feed water, which I'm going to mention today, but also in the boiler water and the steam circuits as well. And this was, uh, so these next two slides are taken from a, from a presentation that was put together for the film forming substance conference in 2019. 
and uh, looking at particularly the oxides in all ferrous condensate. So this is uh, 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 essentially uh, air cool condensers as we're, as we're talking today. And, uh, and so a little schematic, a uh, little schematic here just to il illustrate it. So this uh, blue here at the bottom is the carbon steel. It could be the carbon steel of the tube entries and uh, the fluid flow across here is the two phase uh, is the two phase mixture and uh, and this oxide in between is the magnetite is the magnetite that uh, is supposed to be providing protection so we know that the growth of the oxide at this interface at the metal oxide interface here is exactly balanced by the uh, the release of of iron particles and dissolved products into the into the flow, and uh, if there is turbulence like there is in an air cool condenser, then this reduces this boundary layer along the surface and accelerates the process and increases the iron, as as we as we very well know. The mechanism and morphology is very well understood uh, for the for the growth of this oxide. So then we have to imagine. Uh, what, uh, we have to imagine what, what, what happens if we have uh, if we have a film forming substance um, either on the surface or within the oxide itself, and uh, and try to uh, think about what could happen. It could reduce the liquid on the surface and restrict access of, um, of, of oxidizing species, or it could restrict the growth of the ferrous hydroxide along the metal of the metal oxide interface. Um, it's not known. Uh, we're intending to take a look at that um, in the in in the near future. So this is one of the uncertainties. And the last the last slide here is uh, some uh, final thoughts on on the corrosion. And again, this is based on uh, inspection and assessment work that I've conducted in the in these countries, uh, plus uh, plus the other information from ACC. UG presentations and the IAPS presentations that I mentioned. So, what what we can say is that increasing the condensate pH to 9.8 will gradually eliminate the FAC two phase FAC damage at the tube entries, and the iron level will reduce to internationally suggested levels, uh, it, typically less than five ppb. It's documented by the uh, by the DC. We encourage people all over the world to use the DACI so that we know exactly how that compares with the, with the database. Uh, film forming substances, um, as you'll see um, later today, uh, also work, uh, but there's not sufficient detailed documentation before and afterwards, and currently no understanding of, the improve, of, of how the improvement takes place use, using as I showed you this for the, across this wide range of uh, film forming substances. Damage on the cross members and the support members is not, um, is not doesn't seem to be a, a arrested as quickly by increasing the pH. And uh, there's been some discussion that this damage is slightly different than the, at the tube entries and could be due to um, what's called liquid droplet impingement um, because of the larger droplets that come off the back end of the turbine. And as I've shown you, much care, much care is required when using a film forming substance because uh, for the possible problems that could exist in the remainder of the plant. This has to be dealt with very, very carefully. So, so this is the end um, of the of the of the first presentation. And um, not just let me to get back here. So, um, so Andy, um, I don't know whether you have any questions, or we'll just leave them until the general session, and and, and move on. Um, yeah, if you can hear me, um, I think we'll be fine saving those for the general session, unless anyone has a question or two they want to ask right now. Yeah, yeah, I we have we have we have plenty of time and and will keep it, keep us on track. I think so. That's so so that's okay. Um, I don't see any immediate hands being open. So 
So let's move on to the um, so let's move on to the second presentation here uh, from Sabello Canelli. From uh, he's a uh, senior chemist at uh, Eskom's Madupi uh, Power Station in South Africa. And Sabello, please uh, please proceed. Introduce yourself and proceed. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Bill Dooley. I hope uh, you can hear me clearly. Uh, firstly, I would like to take this opportunity and thank uh, the team behind the ACC Users Group for accepting my presentation. And also, I thank you to you, Dr. Perry Julie, for inviting me to take part in this session. I would like to think that my presentation is not the longest. I'm going to start by giving you a concise background on ESCOM Medubi power plant, a concise background on Unit 5 cyclic chemistry control requirements, because this assessment is based on Unit 5, as well as uh, I will share with you the findings of the visual inspections that were conducted in Unit 5. Um, I'm going to rely on Scott in terms of moving the slides as I don't have the means to move the slides from my side. Okay, Medupi uh, power station is one of the two recently built uh, ESCOM fossil fuel power plants. It is situated in the Lepopo province in a city called Lepalale in South Africa. Medubi consists of six supercritical one store units, each with a gross megawatt output of 794 megawatt. All units are now fully commissioned and are operational. The first unit to be constructed and commissioned was Unit 6, which was followed by Unit 5, and Unit 1 was the last unit. Unit 6 was commissioned in February 2015, and the last unit we commissioned it in 2019. Each unit consists of the 8 by 8 ACC arrangement with the, with the ACC surface area of about 72,252 square meter, huge surface area. The ACCs are manufactured entirely from carbon steel material huge concern for corrosion. The all volatile treatment oxidizing regime was employed for feeder treatment during unit five commissioning. And this was the case with all other units. During commissioning, we were employing uh, all volatile treatment oxidizing as a feeder treatment regime. But at post commissioning, then we transitioned to alkaline oxygenated treatment I'm going to uh, explain that in detail on the third slide. Uh, for unit five, alkaline oxygenated treatment was implemented in July 2018. Unit five ACC internal inspections were conducted during the first major outage prior to transitioning to alkaline oxygenated treatment, as well as five months after transitioning to alkaline oxygenated treatment. So what we are going to see here, we are going to see the appearance of, of, of internal surfaces when the unit was employing the alkyl uh, and all volatile treatment oxidizing the regime, as well as after transitioning to alkaline oxygenated treatment regime to see the difference or the benefits. Can move to the next slide, Scott. I would have loved to share with you an even better picture, but I couldn't get a very good shot, but that is uh, the Medubi power station front view of the air-cooled condensers. Next slide, Scott. Let's look at the background on cyclic chemistry control unit five and all other units. And based on the ESCOM experience and experience gained elsewhere, it has been proven that conventional oil volatile treatment is not adequate to minimize corrosion in the ACC. I am going to briefly explain this. Uh, conventional AVTO, this is in ESCOM's terms. 
at SCOM were referred to AVTO at pH equal or less than 9.6 as conventional since all stations at ESCOM that uh, are, are operating on AVTO, there is none before me to be and to see that the new power station, there is none that was operating at a pH or at a pH greater than 9.6. That is why we term this AVTO as conventional, even though when you look at the IAPS, you will see that the, the pH range for the uh, uh, AVTO is still uh, about 9.2 to 9.8. So this conventional is in ESCOM's terms. After five months of operation, unit five filler treatment was converted to alkaline oxygenated treatment regime. And this is the regime that we adopt for all units once uh, the circuits are cleaner, uh, the units are stable, as well as the cyclic chemistry has improved. Then we transition to alkaline oxygenated treatment. Basically, this is a, a, a modified version of the, of the oxygenated treatment. In ESCOM terms, again, I have to indicate that because uh again if you look at um what is av what what is ot in terms of uh, 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 iaps you will see that the ranges that we're operating at they are well within the iaps ranges for oxygenated treatment but we term this as alkaline oxygenated treatment to differentiate the supercritical units to other escom units since these two un these two stations or power plants are operating at elevated pH when compared to other ESCOM power plants. Hence, we adopted the term alkaline oxygenated treatment. But, but you can still see this as the normal oxygenated treatment according to IAPS. Unit 5 psychic chemist monitoring and control was and continues to be conducted in accordance with the April guideline for new high reliability fossil plants. In this table, what I have I have selected uh, chemical parameters that we monitor for economizer as well as for the mainstay, just to show you the, the, the specification for those selected parameters. Uh, next slide, Scott. This is the feed water uh, uh, pH uh, trends prior to the inspections. It is very much important that one, uh, when you when, when you are going to do the inspections to have the cyclic chemistry uh, control data in mind because it is going to help you in terms of making sense of what you observe when you do internal inspections. After all, internal inspections are there to confirm the effectiveness of your cyclic chemistry management program. So we can see that um, the feed order pH control was well within the range most of the times. If you look at during early operation, yes, the data in, uh, include the events such as um, um, steam part blow through data. That is why you will see the pH way of the range, difficult control. But as we started with the commissioning, we got the better control of the pH. And then we started to operate well within the required pH range. This is basically to give you the background information in terms of the feed water and steam pH, because this is critical when we start assessing the chemistry of the ACC condensate. Next slide, Scott. Looking at the ACC condensate chemistry, um, in these units, ammonia is, is, is used as the only alkalizing agent. And what we know about ammonia is that it is a weak base. It doesn't dissociate completely in water. So equation one is the equilibrium reaction of, of, of the reaction of ammonia and water, and the equilibrium constant is given by equation two. And at standard conditions, water is primarily in a repeat form with minor dissociation according to equation three and equation four. Now, one can use the isochromic approach to 
determine the values of the dissociation constant of water at different temperatures using water specific constants. The same approach can also be used to determine the values of the of equation two using ammonia specific constants. This information can then be combined to calculate the ACC condensate pH at temperature, at process temperature. Next slide, Scott, please. In this table, what I have, I have um, the calculated um, pH at different uh, uh, ACC condensate temperature as per the design uh, 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 temperature range at specific ammonia concentration. From this table, one can see that neutral condensate pH as well as the calculated actual pH at specific ammonia concentration decreases as the temperature increases. Now, if you look at the practice in power plants, we always refer to all analysis to a reference temperature of 25 degrees Celsius. We bring the sample, the, the, the mainstream temperature down to 25 degrees Celsius or just under 50 degrees Celsius, and then we analyze it using different means. What does this tell us about the chemistry at temperature? Basically, this information tells us that it is not always the case that we should rely on information that is reported at standard temperature because the chemistry at temperature will most likely be different depending on the species that are present in either water or steam. So it is important that one understand the condensate chemistry as relying on the pH to control and mitigate the corrosion in the ACC without taking into account the temperature effect is not going to be effective. Um, Ken Gart, in his previous work, has indicated that the minimum change in pH of one pH unit at temperature is required in order to elevate the pH of the ACC condensate in turn, helping to minimize AFAC in the ACCs. If you look at the table, you will see that the change in pH in almost all temperature uh, uh, ranges, it's above one pH unit, which shows that the requirements or the cyclic chemistry control requirements at Medubi power plant is well within the required range to help minimize FAC in the air cool condensers. Uh, next slide, uh, Scott. So what I have here, I have the mainstream uh, uh, quality with respect to the degas conductivity after cation exchange, as well as the ACC common outlet total ion. Why I brought in the mainstream is the mainstream degas cation conductivity. This is to give to give you a feel of the quality of steam or the quality of ACC condensate with respect to corrosive anionic species throughout the the, the period that was selected prior to to the inspection of 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 of, of this unit. This is just to show you how this unit has been operating in terms of corrosive chemical substances, uh, concentration levels in the ACC or in the mainstream. And it shows that the degas, the mainstream degas cation conductivity was kept well below the 0.1 upper limit and most of the time at or below 0.08. Again, the, 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 the data that you see, the early data is associated with, with the commissioning of the unit. Obviously, the unit will not be clean when you commission, 
but it will get cleaner and cleaner during the LO operation. But it, it can be seen that the mainstream qualities, the mainstream the gas cation conductivity was kept well within the acceptable uh, uh, range. What I also have here is I have the ACC common outlet total ion. Again, you will see that during the LO operation of commissioning, ion was very high, the unit is very dirty, but over time, the total ion as measured at the ACC outlet decreased and was well within the, 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 the boundary limit. The total ion concentration was higher, but largely within specification when the unit was on AVTO and showed further improvement when the unit was on OT. If you look at further right, that is when the unit was already on, on, on OT or AOT, very low uh, uh, total ion levels that were measured at that period. This information is consistent with the Dooley Aspen pH versus ion relationship that Dr. Dooley has just shared with us in his presentation. If you can move to the next slide, Scott. On the internal inspections, um, like I have indicated before, that optimal cyclic chemistry program should be should, should be validated by conducting uh, visual inspections of internal surfaces in order to confirm the effectiveness of the chemistry programs. And these inspections they also help us to alter or to improve our our cyclic chemistry uh, 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 programs. The internal inspections was conducted in accordance with the guidelines for the internal inspection of the air cool condensers, um, the ACC01. Corrosion, uh, according to the guideline, corrosion is quantitatively defined using the corrosion index, the DASI, uh, Dr. Dooley has shared it with us, and the index separate described the corrosion in the lower as well as the upper section of the ACC. And those are the lower tax ratings as well as the upper tax ratings. The image I have here is the top view of the air cool condensers from the unit six to the last unit. What is of interest here is if you look at the lower ducts, the two ducts, you will see that as they rise, there are two risers, and each riser split into two and which which further split into two as a result you get the eight by eight acc arrangement uh, next slide scott in terms of the the findings from the inspections the two the two uh, lower ducts the exhausting ducts this is good appearance. We can see there is hematite formation, even though the, 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 the unit at the time was on AVTO, but one can tell again that the hematite formation was not so uniform, but they aren't obvious areas of severe corrosion when you're looking at the first top images. Very good uh, protection, hematite could also be improved. On the on, on, on the lower images, I have LP uh, uh, turbine one exhaust duct, uh, the train, when the unit was on A. Can you still hear me? If you can just indicate, Scott, if you can still hear me. Yes, yes. You can hear you back. Yes, yes, You're yes, back. yes. Okay, great, great, great. Uh, the, 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 the two bottom images on the on, on the left, it's the train of the duct when the unit was still on AVTO. And on the right is the train of the duct when the unit was now on OT or AOT. But we need to remember, this was just five months after transitioning to AOT or on OT. And we could already see the improvement in terms of the formation of the hematite. But it, there is still room for improvement again. Okay. 
But this is just to show that transitioning from AVTO to OTO, AOT, uh, it had a positive impact on the lower ducts. If we can go to move to the next slide, uh, uh, Scott. Here I have the 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 louvers, the inlets to the vertical risers. Both these images were taken uh, last when the unit was already on AOT, and you can see again. I, I must I must mention that yes, the internal surfaces are well preservated. But the images, you can still tell that there is the, the, the hematite formation is not as uniform as you would like it to be. And this indicates that the transitioning, or this was a period where the unit was still transitioning. So it's, it's, it's not as uniform as you'd like it to be, but it is different to the appearance that we observed when the unit was on AVTO. So this shows the positive impact of transitioning from AVTO to OT. Next slide, Scott. Again, it's, 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 it's the same comparison in terms of the appearances um, on, 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 the, on, on my left, top left, the unit was still on AVTO. And this is the steam distribution duct inlet louvre. And if you compare it to the one on the right, you can see the improvement in terms of the um, uh, uh, protection of the internal uh, uh, surfaces. Bottom images, not so good, but we can see that with OT and, 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 and properly optimized, we can see an even better improvement on those units. In terms of the ratings, I'm not really covering on the ratings, but um, yeah, uh, uh, I'm not going to cover on the ratings, but they are indicated on the presentation. Uh, we, we can move to the next slide, Scott. Of interest uh, uh, on this slide is the observation that was made on um, the 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 top uh, right image as well as the bottom left image and i must uh, indicate that i made a mistake on the rating of the bottom left image that is not excellent or good uh, appearance of 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 the internal surfaces that should have been given a rating of four but i must indicate that the appearance of where you see severe corrosion on those two images. This was on selected tube entries. And this was not uh, in all the ducts that were, it was only on few ducts that were inspected. And these was on the tube entries that are near the, the, the steam entrance. So this is something that is very much of interest to us now because this was the first inspection to be done at the station, very new. And this, 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 these are the things now that we're looking for as we now do more inspections in, in, in other units. But this was not um, found in all the ducts and it was only found on selected tube entries, severe corrosion. Uh, and on my uh, bottom right, that is the um, steam distribution manifold. When the unit was now on oxygenated treatment, we can see the improvement in terms of the protection of the internal surfaces. But with time and optimal oxygenated treatment, we expect to see even better uniformity uh, 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 in terms of hematite formation. Uh, la uh, next slide, Scott. Uh, in closing, uh, I, 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 I can say that the selected cyclic chemistry data that we've just went through showed that Unit 5 cyclic chemistry control program was effective for ACC corrosion control. We've seen the corrosion, the, the total ion data. We've seen or we've done the visual inspection and have seen how the internal surfaces appear. 
The choice of applying elevated pH AVTO regime over the conventional AVTO during commissioning proved to be beneficial. We have seen that there is even adequate protection of internal surfaces, even when the unit was on AVTO. We've seen even the formation of hematite on the lower steam distribution duct. So AVTO, elevated pH AVTO was beneficial. Generally, the entire ducts were actively passivated with minor active corrosion on the walls and steel supports. I don't think I included many pictures with steel supports, but yes, there was minor corrosion on walls and steel supports. There, there were a selected number of tube entries that showed severe corrosion immediately below the seal weld um, at the tube entry. I've just uh, uh, covered that now. Significant corrosion was also observed on structures which are on the steam path. I think I only have one image of a structure that is on the steam path, but on the report on my paper, I have even more pictures. Oxygenated treatment or alkaline oxygenated treatment provided adequate oxidizing power to promote the formation of hematite in the ACCs. We've seen the images. We've compared the, the appearance of, of, of surfaces before and after transitioning to oxygenated treatment. More inspections will be conducted in the future to further enhance our understanding of the ACC, of, of, of ACC corrosion control. As I have indicated, these are the new units. These are the first unit to be inspected, and we are planning to do even more studies or more inspections on our units. Other corrosion monitoring techniques, such as the use of target plates in strategic areas, may also be considered. We're engaging with our turbine engineering counterparts to see what else can we adopt that will help us to further improve the um, corrosion in our ACCs. Where can possible use of alternative amines to further optimize the two-phase pH will also be considered. Uh, there is a project in ESCOM that looks that seeks to look at the use of uh, alternative amines, and Medubi Power Plant is looking that with keen interest. Uh, next slide, Scott. This is my last slide, and I would like to thank everyone for giving me an opportunity again to share with you this. Um, uh, may to be experienced. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, thank you, Bello. Very nice, uh, very nice presentation. And actually, to see the plant operating, uh, that's uh, very good. Now, we don't, um, we we haven't received any any uh, any questions, but uh, and we'll have some general discussion a little later. But I I just have a very quick question for you as to um, whether there was a condensate uh, filter and what the size of it was, and then a question on whether you measured the ACC outlet iron before or after the filter, if, if there is a filter. Uh, yeah, I think I got your qu question, uh, uh, Dr. Perry Dooley. Um, we do have um, pre-polishing filters. Basically, they are prior to the condensate polishing plant. We have a full flow um, condensate filters. So um, we are using five micron absolute, very effective. Yes. And ion or total ion is measured before the pre-polishing filters. Maybe if I can add again uh, in terms of the run length of these filters, because it depends on 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 the unit as well. A unit that doesn't go down uh, 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 more frequently, you will find filters running longer. I have one unit that has ran up to four months without changing the filters, but normally you will get about two two and a half months or up to three months. We running at uh, we running the the filters. Uh, we having the five micron absolute filters, and uh, total ion is measured before the filters. Good, uh, uh, excellent, uh, uh, Sabella. That's what uh, that's what I thought. I just wanted to 
uh, make sure every, everybody uh, everybody understood that. So uh, I have some uh, general comments to make, but we'll make those in the discussion period about uh, the passivation um, of the surfaces and how that does not take place during operation. Um, and uh, we'll talk about that a little later because there's quite a bit of confusion about that around the world. So uh, for now, Sabello, thanks very much for a nice presentation and uh, we'll maybe continue the discussion in the discussion period. Thank you. Thank and, you, Bill. Uh, yeah, thank you. And then we'll move to the next presentation by Jeff Damatos, who is a chemist at Cogentrix. And uh, Jeff, please proceed and um, uh, introduce yourself. Uh, yeah, hi, I'm Jeff Damatos. I'm uh, the Cogentrix engineer for uh, chemistry and balance of plant mechanical equipment. And uh, is this uh, slideshow um, ready to go or do I need to load my own screen? Uh, can you load your presentation, Jeff? It's already, I guess it's already okay. So, um, so yeah, Cogentrix Energy is a um, independent power producer. States we operate about twenty power plants, uh, mostly across the East Coast and in the Midwest. Um, the power plant in question we're talking about today, um, Pennsylvania, and we have actually four identical units, they're H-class, uh, one-on-one combined cycles with triple pressure um, Fairly high, uh, fairly high pressure, steam, main steam, and um, it's, you know, it's a little bit higher temperature than uh, IOPS suggests for amine-based filming products, but we have, in fact, um, done some trials using uh, the anodamine, uh, non amine based filming products and two different types of filming amine that were provided by uh, our chemistry supplier. Um, uh, the, the, plant, the plant that we're talking about has a pretty severe strain of the permanent bond of transport. As it just Jeff, uh, Jeff, we keep, lo we keep losing you. Can you speak closer to the microphone, please? Um, yeah, the, uh, the plant in question here, um, has had a pretty, has had a pretty severe history of corrosion product transport out of the ACC and damage caused to the combined cycle, uh, as a result. Um, this is just a, this is just a list of the kinds of damage that we've seen. We've had plug condensate pump strainers, feed pump strainers, um, almost all of the Major valves have been bound up at one point in time, including main reheat stop valves. Um, we've had we've had plugged main reheat steam strainers that we've had to take the plant offline to clean out. Uh, impulse lines on pressure transmitters and level sensors that have caused uh, you know, plant trips for high, uh, you know, false uh, high high boiler drum levels. Uh, temperation block valves getting stuck and, and not being able to control steam temperature. And probably the worst is uh, the solid particle erosion that we've experienced. Um, the things like the boiler feed reg valves and, uh, and economizer bypass valves are, that are severe service valves that this plant has uh, were being rebuilt twice a year, uh, it, which is a great expense. Uh, to have to do that every outage, most most plants I would say should be rebuilding those every two years or every five years, depending on on uh, depending on the service. But twice a year is, is clearly excessive. Um, and and the worst of all the damage that we experienced was uh, some of the high pressure drains, which are the board before and after seat drains uh, for the main steam stop valves uh, and control valves. That uh, when when you're starting up, they, they're supposed to be open to to warm up the main steam valves. Those actually had solid particle erosion, uh, completely destroying the stem and the seats of those valves, um, which led to them constantly blowing by when the plant was operating. And this ended up um, essentially eroding away and blowing out the uh, the flash tank drain header, uh, which which caused you know, essentially a, a steam line rupture. 
uh, in the turbine building. Uh, so there were there were multiple events of that rupturing and having to rebuild it. So uh, in all, in the first three years of the plant operation before we bought these plants uh, from the previous owners, they lost over 2,000 hours of uh, of availability. So that's I mean, you can do the math of how much money that cost the previous owners. Uh, so it's, it's just you know just an idea of how important. Um, ACC chemistry really is um, all these things were the root, you know, the root cause of all these problems was chemistry. Um, the trials that we've that we've done on these four plants, you know, it's great that we have plants that are identical that we can um, experiment slight changes to each of the plants and compare the results. So last uh, Five years, we've had we've had sort of an evolution. They, they came into commercial operation in 2016. Um, they, when they first came into commercial operation, they they were not using the elevated uh, pH set points that that Barry has suggested was 9.8 or higher, and that's when most of the initial damage happened. Uh, they did raise the pH set points in 27 and 2018. In 2019, um, at one of the plants, we started a filming amine trial um, where they had a side by side with uh, the OLDA product on one side and then the anodamine on the other side. Um, at that, you know, at the end of that trial, the plant was sold to us, and uh, in the in the interim, they didn't really do much. And then in 2020, we picked back up the trials and uh, and. Basically, you know, so I'm showing the results of the trials that were that we basically finished in 2020 and early 2021. Today, the the typical chemistry you'll see on these plants is not something that you would say is typical of other plants. It's, it's pretty it's pretty far out there. Um, chemistry people glancing at this might notice the the Cation conductivity levels that you see um, across all four units. You should expect to see slightly higher cation conductivities when you're running a higher pH, but uh, we're something like 10 times the normal levels of cation conductivities in this plant. Um, I can, I can I'll, the next slide, I'll explain why that happens. Um, and it's because of the way the process is configured with the vacuum pumps, but. Uh, You'll also notice the pH doesn't match the conductivity. Uh, in this plant, we control uh, ammonia dosing based on conductivity. We have it, normally have it set at 28 uh, microsiemens per centimeter. And uh, the results of the pHs that you're seeing there are actually caused by um, some you know, some instrumentation problems that have that have were prop that propped up because of the uh, or. or during maybe not because of but during the filming amine trials. So um, I, those pHs are not correct, but but that's what we see day in and day out. And with all the with all the uh, consultants that we fired to try to get the pH meters to work in this plant, it doesn't it hasn't uh, hasn't ever matched conductivity, which is quite bizarre. Here's here's a diagram of the uh, process that we have for our vacuum system that is causing. Basically, what we have here is um, steam, the steam comes out of the exhaust duct. Air um, goes through the air cooled condenser, um, coming out of the air cooled condenser through the deflagmator section. It goes it goes through a two stage vacuum pump. Um, the the you know, liquid seal ring type vacuum pump. Um, the overflow water from the seal tank. Since this plant does not have any wastewater discharge capabilities, all this seal water is recovered and and pumped back into the condensate receiver with the rest of the condensate. So this the water coming out of the seal water tank is about uh, is about a thousand to two thousand conductivity. Um, we believe that that's mostly ammonium carbonate. We have done a couple samples and and we've verified that there you know there's not a lot of organics. Um, there's not there's not we don't have sodium, we don't have chlorides. 
almost all that catechon activity that you're seeing as a result of the seal water recycling back to the condensate receiver. We've done trials um, cutting off that seal water recycle for a short period of time, pumping it into a coat instead, and the uh, the cation conductivity around the process uh, goes right back down to normal when we do that. So, um, I'm, I'm, I'm assuming um, some of that high cation conductivity could be what's causing some of the damage or what was causing some of the damage previously, um, but that's that's just the way it is, and we're trying to learn how to deal with it. I guess I'd like to talk now about the results of the trials that we've done with the filming amine and the. Bottom line up front, uh, both, both the filming amine and the anode amine uh, worked pretty well. Concentration uh, in the condensate. This type of have a condensate filter so. This is with this is with the high pH. Yeah, you know, we were seeing 100 to you know spikes up to up to 450 parts per billion of iron in the LP drum, and the condensate was was running you know in the in the range of 50 to 100 quite commonly uh, parts per billion of iron. Uh, that's that's what was causing all the damage. Uh, we started the amine trials and and uh, sorry the filming amine trials and. The, and the anodomy trials, and uh, within a few months, we were down to basically zero most of the time. So, you know, I, I'd say when we when we went back and measured all of the uh, all the samples, all the grab samples that we took, you know, overall we saw seventy to ninety percent reduction in corrosion and product transport out of the air cooling condenser. Um, the the fill forming I mean did almost just as well as the anodomy um, on the on the condensate samples, the the main difference between two products, uh, the amine based product didn't seem to work in the HP drum. Um, it it you know, that's uh, you know fortunately that's not what we were trying to uh, that's not what we were trying to control. We're mostly concerned with the iron coming out of the air cooled condenser, but uh, uh, in the L, in the LP drum uh, the Amine based filming products seem to do a little bit better for keeping the iron concentration in the LP drums down. Um, the, uh, yeah, okay, so I'll just let this go on. So, um, there's, there's a sort of a list of hypothetical risks of using amine based filming products, and, and I just wanted to highlight. Because most most of the uh, scares you know that you might have didn't come to fruition. Um, we, you know, what, what, here's what here's what did happen to us. Um, people say building amines may cause trouble with online monitors, and we did see an effect on online pH in, instrumentation, as you saw in the earlier slide with chemistry. Uh, it doesn't it has you know it doesn't match uh, the pH doesn't match the conductivity, and we never could get it to. Uh, after we started using the filming amines. Um, there's there's a hypothetical risk that you could have gunk formation um, with the filming amines if you overfeed it. And mo most of the time we did not see gunk, any gunk formation, but we did in one instance, which I'll talk about more later, um, we had gunk balls in the turbine exhaust duct. And these, these actually appeared after, it, it was in the middle of an outage, uh, I inspected that ACC duct with three different groups of people, and the first time we inspected it, uh, we didn't see any gunk balls, and then the second time we didn't see any gunk balls, and the third time the gunk balls just appeared, and it was it was right after a freeze. So so something came out of solution, and uh, and I think it was it was temperature based. So the puddles of water there had stuff in it, and it just came out. Um, so here's a here's a picture of the gunk ball incident. Um, a lot of the, the purple lines you see there are 
are the plant load and the orange and blue lines are the condensate strainer differential pressure and, and what happened is when we started up after that outage where we had the dump ball um, and you know, we experienced the condensate strainers uh, plugging up uh, this plant has two 50% condensate pumps and they each have a simplex strainer so there was no redundancy to be able to change them and then you could see every every day we were having to come down on load and change the condensate pump strainers and that that went on for about two months, um, we stopped using uh, the amine based filming product uh, as a result of this and uh, and switched the unit to anodamine. And, and right about, I think, right, right about here in the beginning of March um, is where we stopped the amine based filming product. And it took about a couple of weeks, and, and the condensate pump strainer plugging issues went away. So, um, you know, that, that's why I, I attribute it to the Amy base filming product. Uh, it's, you know, it's possible that could be, there could have been multiple causes, but um, it's, it seems to me like um, that's, you know, that's, it was a direct result. And it's, and again, it's winter time and, and we did see, you know, colder exhaust out temperatures during this period of time. So it might be something where it, it works fine when it's hotter and it's not so good when it's colder. But this was the only one of the four units that we saw a condensate pump strainer plugging up. Um, overall, from this instrument, uh, from this incident, we lost about sixteen thousand megawatt hours. Um, you know I, I, how severe that is. I guess it depends on uh, on um, so so here's some uh, here's some photos. I just what the plant looked like internal inspections before we started using amine based filming products. This was all on AVTO with uh, temperature 10.1. See, you know, um, plug position, you can see all the little piles of iron everywhere. Um, and, you know, quarter inch thick in the drums, some places. Photo on the upper left is the monkey bars area. You can just see piles of iron on the ground. Right is uh, uh, in the turbine exhaust area before it, uh, right after it comes out of the steam turbine on the wall. You can see two phase FAC. Um, further downstream is the bottom left. You can you can see orange rust. Um, that's that's where there's a little puddle of water and the metal's unprotected under it. Um, and then the lower right is the typical area of the turbine exhaust duct. Um, that particular spot is near a uh, is near where a bypass comes in, and it just bypass blasts all the all the passive oxide off of the walls, and and that's what you're left with is just a giant spot of that they see. Um, here's some here's some drum photos. Uh, this was uh, the three different practicing at the same time. Um, means, you know, it seemed to do a little bit better in the drums. You can see the anodamine, um, the spots around the belly pans that we, you have that, you have that weird effect where it, it boils the, see that that, that metal appears to be passivated where there's the shiny spot by the belly pan, but it didn't, uh, but it didn't peel back over with hematite. Um, the uh, high pressure drum on the same unit, and it, again, it looks like you know there's no there's no side piles on the floor anymore. Both of the both of the products did a good job of uh, reducing the amount of iron that was going into those drums and stinks. A bit better in the drums. Uh, more drum photos. Not, not a whole lot of corrosion in the drum photos. Um, so these are the. This is the area where probably the FAC is the worst. Right after it comes out of the turbine exhaust and goes around the corner into the. Uh, 
uh, stabilizing bars that The, the filming of me that what was notable is that right when the unit shut down, we didn't see a lot of flash rust starting, but 2 weeks later, um, it, it looked just like it was unprotected. And it wasn't, you know what I mean? That that wasn't the case 2 weeks after shutdown. It looked just as good as, uh, this. Here's, here's a comparison of the turning veins. Um, try, you know, I tried to take pictures of about the same spots on the. Uh, the three different things. There's there was a this this plant has a wide variety of of how of how bad the things are. We have a lot of we have big FAC spots. Those are particularly hard to protect. Um, even with the filming mean the filming mean didn't seem to do anything during the around the. Um, Users where the bypasses come in uh, are particularly hard to protect. Uh, anotomy didn't seem to change the, the pattern of FAC right around that. It just it just is not tenacious. Same with the filming amines, and we just haven't seen anything that can protect that area. Right coming out of the turbine, um, you can see this little two-phase two FAC where the Here's, here's a picture of our gunk balls. Um, we did get some samples of the gunk balls. It, it appears that uh, that the gunk balls themselves are not the film. Uh, the, if you can see from the see from uh, graph that this is this is IR spectrum. Um, the, the gunk balls were the blue line. Right, and and we have an OH band in this, and there's no there's no OHs in the filming. I mean, and uh, we have this other peak here where there's a C double bond with an O, and and the the amine peak the amine peak is there, so there's probably some amine in it, <laughs> but it appears that uh, that this gunk ball deposit uh, is probably something like a breakdown product of the filming amine or breakdown product of the dispersant that, that goes along with it, or uh, or maybe it's a, a product of uh, biological uh, mechanisms if there's some kind of bacteria um, eating the filming amine. But, but it's certainly not exactly the same thing. Some more close ups of what the gunk balls look like in our in our turbines. This is all puddles on the floor. You can see there's there's uh, globules sort starting to. Pretty much everywhere where water was running down, you can see these bright red streaks. Uh, picture on the right is where the pump suction is taking off, so it's not. It's usually pretty dry when Just more pictures of the streaks on everywhere that the water touches. So that's so that's the gunk ball. And that, that was I think that was the deciding factor with the gunk ball. Uh, we did get a chance this last spring to go into the upper exhaust ducts. So the pictures on the left, I tried to match the exact same spot. Pictures on the left are are from uh, March of 2019 before they started the amine based filming trials. And the, the pictures on the right are from this March uh, after we, uh, they're from the, the plants using the notamine um, after, I guess they were on, they were on a pretty high dose of the notamine for about, for about a month. Before they shut down, um, you can see 
quite a bit. You can see quite a big difference in the amount of two phase FAC. Uh, the tube entries before were almost all completely wiped clean of passive oxide, and now it seems to be starting. And here's a close up of some, some more tube entries. This is on the uh, this is on the near side uh, where the steam first goes in. The the previous picture was was sort of towards the end. Uh, before we we had you know pretty much again. What I mean, you can see everything's hydrophobic. Um, it's not completely covered up in red, but uh, but there's no flash rust. And you can see in the worst spots, there are still a little bit of two phase FAC right at the two bed crease. Uh, here's some more. So, since these are all after pictures, uh, zoomed in, you can see hydrophobic surface left. Most of the tubes had no damage. Some of them had very little amounts. And then there's still a few spots where there's no protection. And you can see little pitting started. Uh, here's a picture of the scope of the condensate headers coming out of the ACC before and after, you know, um, Amy based filming products and the non Amy based filming products. Put it in, but what they don't do is clean up, uh, you know, your dead spots. Chip scale that's there, it's, it's going to still be there. It's going to take a while. Here's the monkey bars area, and then the same the same terrain. So you can see on the left, uh, totally protected before the products. And and on the right, that's the same exact spot on the same unit. Um, after. So uh, that's that's all that's all I've got for you guys. And if you guys have any questions, I'll be happy to answer. Yeah, Jeff, thank you, um, uh, Jeff. Thanks very much. Um, as I as I mentioned, the the sound was was the was a, was intermittent, and so uh, we have some questions, and you may have already you may have already uh, included those. But let's just uh, so uh, so let's just try, um, and we're going straight into the discussion session anyway. So the first one was from uh, Andy Andy Howell. Uh, Andy, do you want to do you want to verbalize yours? Sure. Yeah, Jeff. Um, my question was, uh, what was the mesh size of your condensate strainers, if you know that, or approximately? And then, did you have photos of those? I don't think I saw any in the report. Yeah, I, I didn't show the four photos of the condensate pump strainers. Um, there, there's, there's only an after. There's only you know, there's, we only have one picture of it, and it's it doesn't really look all that dirty, um, but okay. it just. It's their 40, the, the strainers are 40 mesh. Okay. Two mesh. Um, okay. And, and it's funny when we, when we pulled them apart, they didn't, they didn't look all that dirty. They just, it was just particulate iron. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Jeff. There's one from uh, 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 Chris uh, Samuelson. Are you on, are you on the line? Can Scott activate you please? Yeah, hi. I was just I was asking about the uh the gunk balls that you showed. Were those from the use of the the film forming amen or or were they from anodamine or, or both? Yeah, the 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 units on anodamine did not have gunk balls. Uh the the film forming amine well, I guess we had film forming amine on three different units. And we only saw the gunk balls on one unit. So it, it, was, it was from the amine, but it's not exactly clear that that the amine was 100% the cause of it. it. I think it was probably breakdown products and a combination 
the temperature that the environment was when we shut down. Uh, but but it was on the filming Amy trial. Yeah. So yeah. So Jeff, that's uh, uh, that's typically what we find. I think it's uh, I think it's a little naughty to just blame it on the Amy because most of the cases that we've uh, seen. Uh, this situation, it's uh, being on an amine with some addition to it, uh, either a dispersant, a polyacrylate, or or some other or some other situation, or uh, or even an o an overfeed situation. Did do you can, can you break it down and, any further? Yeah, um, we we did get some samples of the gunk balls, and it was not an amine. The, the gunk yes. itself was uh, it had it had iron, it had a lot of iron in it. But it was also some kind of carbohydrate. It had an OH in uh, an OH bend and a C double bond O bend in the in the IR spectra. It, it did not have the amine peak. So it's either it's either a buildup of the dispersant, or it's a break. Yeah. yeah. So you're confirming, you're confirming that the that the product uh, did have dispersant in it, right? Well, I. Uh, I don't have information on what the, what the amine was blended with. I, it was an open product, and the um, the uh, the company that sells it is uh, it's, it was a tr it was their second formulation of it, and they they weren't yes. willing to disclose the uh, the the I I think it's a dispersant that they because it's it's one of them that doesn't have uh, neutralizing amines in it. To help yeah. it utilize their yes. using yeah, at a couple of, at a couple of the uh, at a couple of the IAPS uh, FFS international conferences, um, the 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 supplier did divulge that, and uh, and so we sort of look back and and think that it's maybe related to the uh, dispersant, and and now you, you haven't actually said uh, what the FFA was or whose it was. But uh, but uh, normally, uh, if if there's a reformulation, the situation disappears. Yeah, um, I, I would agree with that. Yeah, and um, yeah, so we, we've had quite a few instances of the IAPS international conferences. There's a question from Al. I don't I, I don't know what his last name is. Um, Al. Hey Barry, it's, yeah, it's uh, Al Oshesky. Um I'll just oh, Jeff, okay. I'll just I was just asking about your operating profile. Uh, you know, do you have daily starts? Do you run spring to fall between outages? Um, or are you uh, cycling loaded. double starts? Ba base loaded. Okay, from one outage to the next. It, it'll run. It, yeah, that that plant will run about eight thousand hours a year, and and it's a, whether they're on duct burners or not. Okay, thanks. Yeah, and there's uh, there's there's one from Shane Ferrenti. Um, I, I think we just addressed that. But Shane, please uh, ask the question if you if you want, if you would like to, please. Oh well, sure. I think you answered my questions about if you had any yes. other feed situations. But how were you controlling the chemical feed? Were you um, base feeding it or using steam flow to control? Uh, on on the anodamine trial, we were we just set uh, a pump at one speed and ran it the whole time at the same 20 mils a minute. Um, the other, the Amy base filming product, they, um, the, the chemical vendor did uh, frequent grab samples and used a, used a, uh, a, a test to determine the residual and made a few adjustments on the, based on the residual levels. After a few weeks, they were, they got it stable to where they didn't have to adjust the the amine dose anymore. Good. So Jeff, on the on the on the on the chemical feed situation, I don't know whether you covered this, but did you um uh, were the additions in the normal place at the condensate pump or were they in the transport ducts before the up before the upper duct of the ACC? It, it was in the condensate pump discharge. Uh, okay. And um and then, the, uh, thank you. And Ken, Ken Kurek had a question about iron measurements. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear yeah. you. 
Yeah, you, you had a nice slide on there where you showed your uh, iron uh, and you had like four, I think three or four different uh, points overlaid. I was just curious, was that based on grab samples or was that based on some type of an online iron analysis like particle counting or was that the millipores or just curious? Yeah, so we, we used a combination of millipores and and we actually have a Hawk nephilometer installed, uh, permanently installed, and that's that was calibrated to uh, to read out in parts per billion of iron. So, so we, did, we did have a combination of continuous uh, continuous monitoring on a couple points, and and then grab samples. Okay, very nice. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So that that, that, that was good. So, uh, uh, Jeff, I, I just I just had one 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 other comment for you. You mentioned at the beginning of one of your big beginning slides about uh, solid particle erosion, and. Um, uh, you probably know that that SPE is extremely rare in combined cycle plants, and it's not likely to have come from the air cooled condenser, because the because the because the iron particles are not uh, are not um, hard, hard enough. It's more likely to have come from the superheater or reheater. Yeah, that's. I mean, that's. It's interesting, but I um, it, could, it very well could have come out of the superheater and reheater, but we were. Measuring quite a bit of iron coming out of the condenser, and uh, most of the, the most of the buildup of iron was taking place in the LP drums. Um, yeah. mo and most of the damage happened during startups and shutdowns. So it, it wouldn't surprise me if it was coming out of the superheaters. Yeah, it's all, it's almost certainly because they, because the iron the iron coming from uh, those. Uh, FAC surfaces is, is is not hard enough, and and you probably know for any anybody else's benefit that if you have a sample of the actual stuff that's doing a damage, uh, you, you can actually tell where it comes from using my um, oxide growth and exfoliation paper that we've talked about before. So it was very it was quite interesting. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And, uh, uh, no, so we're now we're now, as everybody knows, into the general discussion part. Um, uh, are there are there any other questions? Does anybody want to raise their hand? You can ask a, you can ask a, a question on any of the any of the presentations. Um, so, um, uh, Scott, I didn't I, I didn't see any um, any any hands raised. There was one, but uh, the gentleman put his hand down. Uh, Barry, I do see that Esteban uh, has his hand yeah. raised. I'm not sure if uh, he, he has a question. So yes, yeah, it, it's but I think he put it down. But he's very welcome to uh, ask a, ask a question if he wants to. Okay, so he can come back in a minute. Uh, I have a, I have a comment uh, for Sabello, but not necessarily just uh, for him. He uh, he made some comments about um, the passivation, and I think he was referring to the red color, and calling that uh, passivation, and that was it wasn't as good as it possibly should be. And uh, uh, there's the situation uh, in the in the ACC is that. There has to be first uh, magnetite uh, formed on these surfaces uh, to in the area in the areas where the turbulence is very high, and uh, once that magnetite has formed, then you can form that red oxide. But we know very well from the science that that red oxide uh, can't uh, can't form during operation because in an ACC you have a two phase mixture, and the and the oxygen is not in the droplets. And uh, we we pretty much well know that that red uh, uh, formation, that color, is is uh, formed during uh, shutdown periods when there's more when there's more liquid uh, that than the, it, the normal two phase mixture. And uh, and if if you have the opportunity to look on a sequential basis at, at those surfaces in the upper ducting, you can actually see, you can actually see that red color. Uh, 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 running down like droplets of water until it becomes until it becomes uh, pre uh, uh, 
uh, uh, pretty well well passivated, and that's what and that's what basically happens on those uh, on those FAC areas of the tube entries and on the uh, and on the uh, uh, structure uh, the structure parts. I mentioned in the presentation that I gave at the beginning. I, uh, that's why I pointed out that the white areas first go to to magnetite before they can form that red formation. So it's um, it, it's quite an interesting th uh, feature that that, uh, uh, that we see. So if the passivation wasn't as good as uh, Sabella thought, then that's the then that's basically the reason. I don't know whether Sabello has any any further comments, but there's a couple of uh, 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 chats here. Just let me find some more. So, um, no, no further comment from me, uh, 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 Barry. I just want to thank you for that uh, explanation of of the observation. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, uh, Sabello, if you want to, if you want to follow it up, it's a, it's it's a little bit detail of the science uh, that we're quite uh, used to now, and uh, I can follow up with uh, with a Teams meeting with you uh, 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 off offline here. So we have a um, we have a comment from a from a David um, here. Is that? Don't know which David it is. Is that David Allison or is it somebody else? Okay, so um, I think it's. Uh, I think this is a general question. Uh, he says that we are trying to recover the water from the seal water tank to the condensate receiver, but when we recover it, the cation conductivities get too high. We believe it's due to the decomposition of the filming amine, so we stop dosing. Uh, we stop dosing it. Is this your opinion? And do you think there are any other problems to recover that water? Anybody? Anybody have a a, a, a comment? I I have a comment on that. I I, I think I tried okay. one of my slides about that exact problem. Uh, at the the two plants I was showing, we we do exactly that, um, recovering the the seal water from the vacuum pumps. And that, that does seem to save a bit of ammonia, but even without the filming amines, uh, the cation conductivity goes through the roof. Uh, you can measure the cation conductivity of that seal water and it's it's a thousand. And I, I think it's ammonium carbonate. We've gotten a few samples of it. Sometimes it has organics and sometimes it doesn't, but it's not, it certainly did not have enough organics to, yeah contribute that much to, to the conductivity. And what, what we're seeing is ammonium carbonate. So the ammonia condenses in that seal water and just sucks all the carbon dioxide out of the non-condensable gas and, and just traps it there in the liquid form. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, yeah, thanks, Jeff. There's been a lot of discussion about this in, uh, in the IAPS um, uh, international FFS uh, conferences. And uh, you will know you will have noticed in the presentation that I gave at the beginning that this is uh, one of the areas of research. Um, it hasn't been done for all the active ingredients. It's only been it's only been done for uh, well quite extensively for ODA and a little bit for older. Uh, but uh, generally, generally, uh, what these increased cation conductivities are, are due to are, are basically not that. Uh, filming amine, but the neutralizing amine or something else that's added to the particular uh, mixture that's that, that that makes the that makes the FFS. So uh, I think we have to move away from just generally talking about um, uh, film forming amines. You've got to think about the P part uh, and uh, and and what's actually in these um, uh, compounds that are that, that are added. They're, they're not simply just the amine. So, does anybody else have a have a comment, or has anybody raised their hand, uh, Scott? I don't see anyone. I don't see anyone. Greg Greg Ballou has his hand raised. So, Greg, you can unmute yourself, please. 
just curious, first of all, on the uh, application with APTO and then the conversion to um, an alkalizing OT program. Uh, were you controlling oxygen levels on APTO? Do you know what they were? And when you went to OT or AOT, uh, what were you doing with oxygen? And was the alkalizer ammonia? The question, Greg, is to uh, Sabello. Correct. Yeah. Okay. And uh, it's uh, yes, yeah, Sabello. Can I can I... that? Yeah, I didn't get that that question. Can I request that to repeat it? Yeah, on ABTO again, ABTO oxygenated. Were there were you controlling oxygen? What were the levels, or was it just allowed to do whatever the unit? Uh, was doing for oxygen, and then your conversion to alkaline oxygen treatment, uh, were you obviously controlling oxygen, what levels, and was the alkalizer ammonia? Okay, I got that one. Thank you very much. Uh, on AVTO, we were keeping dissolved oxygen below 20 ppb, and we were controlling it. Uh, on uh, AOT or oxygenated treatment, we're keeping dissolved oxygen between 50 and 150, our target being 110 ppb. So basically, yes, we were controlling dissolved oxygen on uh, both regimes, AVTO as well as uh, AOT. Thank you. Thanks, Sabello. So, so, Greg, why did you... Why do you think it's important for because the oxygen has basically no effect for the ACC? It only has an effect in the feed water of the plant. Yeah, I'm just I was curious as to what the oxygen levels were just to see if people if there was still controls and actually where they are monitored to see if there's any effects. Because in a lot of the papers we don't hear about what OT levels are. They're allowed to just go where they are. And I believe this facility probably did have some oxygen capabilities and was maintaining even on ABTO. Just to understand, yeah, the levels that uh, the levels that Sabello indicated are, perf are, are perfectly okay, and we don't uh, we don't really try to control the oxygen level in OT, uh, and we try we try to keep the oxygen level you know ten to twenty ppb for AVT, uh, but uh, it's not uh, it's not one of the real critical parameters. Thank you. Uh, uh, the, who else? Uh, does anybody else have any any comments or questions? So, if if um, if not, then I think that uh, we we've done quite well. Uh, we're almost exactly almost exactly on time. Uh, hey, this has been a hey, good Barry. first good first session. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, this is Andy. I have a. I have some a couple of general questions that, uh, Go that ahead. I'm, I'm interested in. One, one is, and and you may have some input on this as well. Is with the film forming chemicals, what kind of time frame do people see to provide protection to the ACC? It's a large structure. It's I know with uh, some of the other plants, it takes can take a while. What what can we expect, and how can we uh, be confident that we've gotten the film? Filming material all all through the air cooled condenser at those uh, duct entries. Yeah. Well, I think there's uh, Andy from from my point of view. Anybody else can make a comment. I think there's there's two ways of looking at that. One is is why we monitor iron. Uh, you can see the iron levels come down uh, uh, gradually, and uh, and that would be one way. And as I mentioned in the first presentation, it's very difficult to know what the time frame is because you don't you're not looking at the inside the ACC every every week or whatever, you know. So you're only looking once a year or, or once a, a longer period. So it's a very difficult to um, it's very difficult to to determine exactly what the what the time is. My so my, oh, my okay. own feeling is that the that the FFS uh, maybe provides that. Uh, uh, protection through forming the magnetite, uh, which is the critical step, a little quicker than with with uh, pH. And as I mentioned also in the first presentation, we don't understand why. We don't really have any idea why why that why that is taking place. So, Mark, uh, hold on. Let, let, let's see. We might have a, a question here. 
a comment. So let's see, hold on. So Mark, uh, my good friend, Mark, the Whisper Lira, uh, do, you, uh, do you have a response on that, Mark? Well, it's just a question that I have, because it's not, for me, it's not addressed well. Uh, when labeling the, uh, the surfaces of the ducts, be it the exhaust steam duct or the uh, steam distribution ducts, labeling it ABC, um, for plants that operate with daily starts and stops, because this has this has an impact on on, on what I see in the uh, in the air cool condensers. I've inspected them uh, many many air cool condensers on, on all types of uh, of regimes, but the ones that operate with a very low pH uh, and with daily starts and stop, it is it is clear that we always see uh, these streaks on the uh, on the surfaces of the of the wall like it is from 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 when the unit is stopped uh the condensate that is running down there will be air inside also uh and and the ph will be low um yes. and this is not addressed when i when i when i try to label them yeah and and mark that was what i was refer that was what i was referring to again in making the general uh, yeah. comment to, to Sabello's passivation because that's exactly what happens. You get this um, ox more oxygenated liquid uh, during that shutdown period and they and, and that liquid runs down the ducts and uh, you can track that and you'll see the, the red areas. And of course, it doesn't really matter what the pH is because uh, because when you operate under oxygenated treatment, it's pH independent. So it doesn't matter that the pH is low. What, what's the important thing is the is the oxygen level in that liquid. Yeah, but it's yeah, it's not on it's not on oxygenated treatment. It's just on AVDO. Uh, exactly, uh, exactly, exactly, exactly. I I I I understand. But as you've indicated, with with uh, air ingress or whatever during the during that uh, shutdown period, that's what is actually doing it. Okay. Yeah, that's pretty. Uh, 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 that's pretty well in agreement. So, um, so Andy, so you you said you had a second question. Oh well, I I I'm just responding to Mark's also that the the intent of the index is to look for corrosion, and usually what we're looking for is the extent of of uh, shiny metal or white areas, so that uh, the the different colorations and the different streaks are not necessarily uh, something that we're we're considering in in that the the uh, corrosion that happens off time offline can be significant in terms of picking up the metals that are that are transported, but in terms of of uh, damage to the base metal, it's probably uh, probably not high. So it's it's there's a little judgment involved there but i would say if you're looking at different colorations that's that's not a big negative on the index well i i look at it oppositely i look at i look upon it as a as a positive uh, you know if you get that if you get that red color that's what uh, sabello indicated what well, he called it passivated but that gives an indication that that, that, that surface has got magnetite on it because the because the red stuff can't grow unless there's magnetite there first. Okay. Yep. So did you have another question, Andy? Um, no, I think we're at the end of the time. We can we can check at the end of the session next session. If there's anything okay. else. Okay. I'm I'm okay. I'm okay. I'm okay. So let's see. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, Scott asks whether I saw the questions from David. I I asked uh, David to um, to speak up. D David, I I don't have the last name, so please speak up if you want to ask these questions. Two questions. Okay. So it doesn't look as if. Um, He's there, or he has a mic, uh, Scott, and so so let's give him the opportunity to come back later. There's another discussion period in the afternoon, and uh, I think we'll close off the morning off the morning session. And there's 
as I understand, we will start again on time, uh, on your time at uh, at one o'clock. Is that correct, Scott? Yes, uh, we're going to enter into a one hour break here uh, and then come back for uh, the, the afternoon session in the US time. Uh, so please join us back here in one hour. I'll send everyone who's on the line right now a reminder to join back in. Uh, we've got three more presentations uh, and one more discussion session to complete the chemistry and corrosion day one of the ACC users group. And, and Scott, uh, are we are we signing out or leaving it active? It, it'll be active. Okay, okay, thank you. Yeah, so if anybody has any other questions that come to mind, please put them in the chat and we'll uh, We'll, we'll save them for the discussion session at the end of the day. Okay, so have a nice, uh, w whatever you do, whatever you do for the next hour. We'll see you at one o'clock in the Eastern, Eastern time in the US. Thank you.